Regular meeting number 11 will now come to order. We please stand for the playing of the national anthem. Brown, would you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This evening, uh, council is joined by Pastor Amy Miracle, pastor of Broad Street Presbyterian Church. We're so uh, happy and grateful to have you back. Thank you. Let us pray. We pray for every member of this city council, for the mayor, for all who serve the city in any capacity. We pray for those who live, work, and care about this city. Remind all of us of your vision for your people Remind us of our own deepest and best aspirations for our community. Keep calling us to work a little harder, to listen more deeply, to dream a little bigger. Remind us of your call to care for the most vulnerable among us. Expand the boundaries of our hearts. For we pray these things in your name, amen. Thank you, Pastor. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Is there a second? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. This week's communications received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read into the record? Not at this time. Thank you, Madam Clerk. At this time, I'm gonna go out of order uh, from uh, a regular uh, reading and, and agenda uh, to go to Councilmember Mitch Brown. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Uh, I have one resolution this evening. I would like to invite Katie Jean Brentlinger and her family, Assistant Chief Jeffrey Happ, Deputy Chief Pat Ferguson, and the IFF Vice President Steve Klein to please approach the podium. I have resolution 0089X2019 to recognize the life of Columbus firefighter Shane R. Brentlinger and to extend our sincerest condolences to his family and friends. Whereas Columbus firefighter Shane Brittlinger has served the Columbus community as a firefighter and paramedic for over nine years, and whereas Shane served as a firefighter with Central Township, Clinton Township, London Fire Department, and Jefferson Township, Delaware Fire Department, and Columbus Division of Fire, 
whereas during his time with the Columbus Division of Fire, Shane was assigned to the Fire Training Academy, where his passion for athletics and fitness led him to revolutionize the fitness training program within the Columbus Division of Fire. And whereas a certified personal trainer with the American Council of Exercise, Shane was an integral part in creating the physical performance program for the Division of Fire recruits and securing new specialized workout equipment for the Fire Training Academy. And where Shane's impact on the Division of Fire will resonate in all those he trained, his emphasis on firefighter health has made hundreds of firefighters safer and more prepared to tackle the challenges they face every day. Where Shane will be remembered for sincere willingness to help those he trained and improve their health and their lives, now therefore be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby honor and recognize and celebrate the life of Columbus firefighter Shane Brittlinger and extends our sincerest condolences to his family and friends. I move for adoption. Second. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. If I would uh, if you allow me, I would now ask for a moment of silence in Shane's name and behalf. Thank you. Would any of my colleagues like to make any comments? If not, Vice President Hine, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Council Member Brown. President Hardin, members of Council, thank you this evening. The past eight days have been some of the most difficult times in the division's recent history. Fortunately, when things get difficult, there's no better group to rise to the occasion than Columbus firefighters. I cannot adequately articulate how much Shane meant to our fire family, nor could I compete with the beautiful words of Katie's father, Chuck, or the powerful testimony of Shane's cousin, Pastor Jason Mead, who was also a member of the Sheriff's SWAT team. So let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> I stand before you tonight to make two promises. First, Shane's death will not have been in vain. We will, in his name, carry on with his mission not only of physical fitness for firefighters, but mental fitness as well. For too long, behavioral health has been an abstract concept in the fire service. For the past three years in a row, we've lost more firefighters annually to suicide than we have on the fire ground. And according to the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance, firefighters are 10 times more likely to turn to suicide than the general population, with at least 37% of firefighters having contemplated suicide. Columbus firefighters will lead the charge to confront behavioral health in the fire service. We will confront it just like we fight a fire, systematically and aggressively, so that we may save our own, so that other husbands, wives, and family members of our bravest may not know the pain and suffering felt by the Brittlinger family. And that leads me to my second promise, to Shane's family. As Jason so eloquently articulated the other day, Time won't heal your wounds, but with faith and family, you will heal. But as the rest of the world gets back to their normal and their routines, one thing won't change, and one group won't go anywhere. Your Columbus firefighters, your fire family, we aren't going anywhere. We will be here for you every single day. And while none of us can fill the hole that we feel in our hearts, we're going to try like hell. We have your back. I promise. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight is a sobering reminder that our first responders are everyday people with extraordinary responsibilities. Each one of them is someone's friend, a relative, and certainly a loved one. While we can sometimes fall prey to viewing them as invincible, Challenging times arise for all of us. It is our responsibility as a community to comfort them as they are there to comfort us. This past week has been a difficult one for our city, especially those in the public safety family. We hold those loved ones and those we've lost in our thoughts and prayers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very
That's all I have, Council President, this evening. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Uh, thank you. The next order of business for this evening uh, is to elect a President Pro Tem of Council following the resignation of former President Pro Tem Michael Cinziano. I open the floor for nominations for President Pro Tem of Council. Council Member Favors. President Hardin, I would like to nominate Elizabeth Brown. Are there any other nominations for President Pro Tem? Seeing none, the floor is now closed for nominations. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Uh, Ms. Brown? <laughs> Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorrance? Yes. Ms. Faber? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. President Harden? Yes, congratulations, Count President Pro Tem Brown. We will now uh, follow back into the regular. Uh, oh, actually, Clerk Blevins will now. Clerk Blevins will now read the new committee assignments into the record. Finance Committee Council Member Elizabeth Brown, Chairperson Committee Members Tyson, Mr. Brown, and President Harden. Recreation and Parks Committee Council Member Elizabeth Brown, Chairperson Committee Members Dorans. Mr. Brown, President Hardin. Education Committee, Council Member Elizabeth Brown. Chairperson, Committee Members, Mr. Brown, Favor, President Hardin. Public Safety Committee, Council Member Mitchell Brown. Chairperson, Committee Members Tyson, Remy, President Hardin. Veterans and Senior Affairs Committee, Council Member Mitchell Brown. Chairperson, Committee Members Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Public Utilities Committee, Council Member Rob Dorrance. Chairperson, Committee Members Ms. Brown, Mr. Brown, President Hardin. Neighborhoods Committee, Council Member Rob Dorrance, Chairperson, Committee Members Favor, Tyson, President Hardin. Technology Committee, Council Member Rob Dorrance, Chairperson, Committee Members Mitch Brown, Ms. Favor, President Hardin. Public Service Transportation Committee, Council Member Shayla Favor, Chairperson, Committee Members Mr. Brown, Ms. Brown, and President Hardin. Housing Committee, Council Member Shayla Favor, Chairperson, Committee Members Remy, Dorans, President Hardin. Criminal Justice and Judiciary Committee, Council Member Shayla Favor, Chairperson, Committee Members Tyson, Dorans, President Hardin. Economic Development Committee, Council Member Emmanuel Remy, Chairperson, Committee Members Favor, Dorans, President Hardin. Environment Committee, Council Member Emmanuel Remy, Chairperson, Committee Members Dorans, Ms. Brown, President Hardin. Administration Committee, Council Member Emmanuel Remy, Chairperson, Committee Members Ms. Brown, Tyson, President Hardin. Zoning Committee, Council Member Priscilla R. Tyson, Chairperson, all members serve on that committee. Health and Human Services Committee, Council Member Priscilla Tyson, Chairperson, Committee Members Remy, Ms. Brown, and President Hardin. Workforce Development Committee, Council Member Priscilla Tyson, Chairperson, Committee Members Dorans, Ms. Brown, President Hardin. Small and Minority Business Committee, Council President Shannon Hardin, Chairperson, Committee Members Favor, Remy, and Tyson. Rules and Reference Committee, Council President Shannon Hardin, Chairperson, Committee Members Ms. Brown, Ms. Favor, and Mr. Dorans. Thank you, Clerk. We will now, now uh, Go back to the regular uh, agenda. Are there any members? Are there any resolutions by members of council, starting with Councilmember Mem President Pro Tem Elizabeth Brown, Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Remy? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Council President Hardin. I would like to invite Lourdes Barroso de Pedia and Lair Marin Marcon and all of our visitors from the Latina Mentoring Academy to the podium. Tonight, I am pleased to introduce Resolution 0087X 2019 to recognize and celebrate the Latina Mentoring Academy for 10 years of inclusive professional development in the city of Columbus in Central Ohio. As of today, the Latina Mentoring Academy is the only professional cultural program development program of its kind in Ohio. 
now in its 10th cycle of self collaborating with organizations at the state and local level, the Latina Mentoring Academy has positioned itself as an unrelenting leader in promoting excellence and leadership for Latinas. With the Latina Mentoring Academy being an entirely volunteer-ran program, through the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, or excuse me, Chamber of Columbus, nearly 200 women having gone through LMA as either mentees or mentors. The Latina Mentoring Academy's community programming has engaged nearly 500 women in the Latino and immigrant communities. Alumni of LMA have gone on to become political leaders, doctors, lawyers, entrepreneurs, activists, and founders of nonprofit organizations. Over its 10-year tenure, the Latina Mentoring Academy has held over 50 events supporting Latinas in the city of Columbus and Central Ohio. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby recognize and celebrate the Latina Mentoring Academy's 10th anniversary on Monday, March 11, 2019, in the city of Columbus. Lourdes Lyre, the floor is yours. Dear Council President Harding and all the members of the City Council, thank you, gracias, so much for this recognition and humbling event for our Latina Mentoring Academy. It is emotional that after 10 years, we are recognized as Latinas here in the Council, so it is humbling. The Academy, or the LMA, as we often refer to it, was founded by the Hispanic Chamber of Columbus 10 years ago, and we have one of our founding presidents, Joel Thierry, with us here today, who found the need at that time with the Chamber, and he recognized that we needed to provide a Latina place where they could cultivate their professional skills through leadership, development, curriculum, while being guided by an established professional in the community to help them advise them on their journey. Over the past decade, the LMA has grown to be a premier professional development program for Latinas in all central Ohio. We are so proud to be the only program of this kind in the state and also throughout the United States. Thanks to our community of supporters, we are excited to announce that we will soon become our own nonprofit organization, giving us the opportunity to reach more women in our community. I want to introduce now our soul our alma of the community, our Lourdes Barroso de Padilla. Thank you, Laid, and thank you again, Council President Hardin. Congratulations, Council President Pro Tem, on Nash on Women's History Month, just a few days after, um, and members of the City Council for this recognition of the Latina Mentoring Academy. Over the past 10 years, we have had nearly 200 women come through the LMA as members of our cycle, as a mentor or advisor, or to lead one of our sessions. And holding true to the idea that empowered women empower women, all of our sessions and conference leaders have volunteered their time to the academy, as does our entire leadership team. This helps keep the cost of the program free to any interested participant. And five years ago, when we began our community programming that offered sessions and half-day conferences to nearly 500 women in our community, and we were delighted to see other immigrant women joining our programming. It is a unique experience to meld your culture with the culture of a new country and community. It has been our focus to present information and opportunities in a way that celebrates both. I want to acknowledge the women in our chamber tonight. They're wearing our LMA red, which, presents, which represents the vibrancy of our community and is, the soul, is one of the colors that represents all of the countries that we represent in Latin America. These are our alumni, or our hermanas, sisters, as we call them, our mentors, our advisors, our madrinas, or godmothers, that support our work. Can I get a WEPA? WEPA! WEPA! These amazing women are doctors, lawyers, engineers, entrepreneurs, and nonprofit founders. They represent all sectors in our community. They are diverse culturally, economically, and racially, and their unique experiences and backgrounds help to break down barriers and build understanding. Together, they, we have built an incredible sisterhood and the most effective attract and retain strategy for Latinas in our great city. They are the leaders that are changing Columbus in ways large and small, and I am so excited for the wave of new leadership, new thinking, and sense of community that they bring to all of us. Muchas gracias to the Columbus City Council. Gracias, Lourdes. Um, if there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Harden. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, 
Thank you. May I move on to my second resolution? I would like to invite Dave McCune and his family to the podium as I introduce resolution 0088. X 2019 to recognize, celebrate, and congratulate Mr. Dave McCune on his retirement from the City of Columbus on this 11th day of March 2019. That, that includes everybody. Come on up. Come on up. Mr. Dave McCune has selflessly served the citizens of Columbus, working for the Department of Public Utilities for over 24 years and the Department of Technology for over 12 years, totaling 37 years of service. That's thir three, seven years of service. In addition to his work at the city, Dave spent his time and energy boldly serving as president of Communications Workers of America, CWA Local 4502, 4502 from August of 2011 until March of this year. He previously served as vice president. Under Dave McCune's leadership, he helped CWA union members file and win grievances, put together a strong negotiating team, and improve the pay, benefits, and working conditions of CWA workers. Workers. Although Dave has chosen to move on, chosen to move on, his legacy of fighting for workers will forever live on, and his dedication will serve as the example for others to follow. On behalf of this council, we thank you for your many years of service, dedication to the city of Columbus, and to the members of CWA Local 4502. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby recognize, celebrate, and congratulate Mr. Dave McCune for his many years of dedication and service to the City of Columbus in CWA Local 4502. Dave, the floor is yours. Wow. Okay. Thank you very oh, wait. much. Oh. Uh, hold on. Hold on. I, I, I forgot to ask President Pro Tem Liz Brown would like to say a couple words. I can't let you talk yet without me talking first, Dave. Um, <laughs> Dave was my union president. He'll always be my union president. Um, when I was a member of CWA Local 4502, I still carry my union card in my wallet. Um, and Dave wasn't just your average union president. Um, I, when I, um, discovered that we didn't have the paid family leave policy I thought we should have at the city of Columbus. I went to Dave and I asked him, you know, what's the history of this? And, you know, rather than giving me um, an email response with some bullet points, he invited me to the union hall to sit down and talk it through. And then to talk about how we might be able to make a change together. And uh, that show of support, um, I think, marks your leadership style. Um, I can't speak to all 37 years that you were at the city. <laughs> I'm only 35. Um, <laughs> but I know that uh, it, is, it is really the, the hallmark um, that I observed of your service. And um, that open style of leadership, um, inclusive style with your members. And I thank you for that. I want to um, highlight your family who, who's here, your wife, um, and um, the other members of your family. Because um, and I think some of you had to travel a bit um, to be here. So um, I know that all of you serve together um, and that can't be understated, sort of what's asked of family members. I also want to point out that not only did you um, serve your members well and your, um, and your city well through your city service, but you also serve the labor movement well. Um, I know you took a bus to um, DC when um, the Janus decision was handed down. And um, I appreciate that you always thought about how what we do here in Columbus um, can stand with workers across the country. So thank you for your service um, and thank you for always being my union president. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's going to be emotional. <laughs> oh, no. So I didn't prepare anything. I really didn't. Uh, actually, my email got deleted. I wrote everything else on, so I, I do apologize for that. That's really not true. I, I didn't write anything. <laughs> I've, Susan, the, the current president, and my, uh, my trusting vice president, uh, two, two different methods, we always, we always gelled. I always shot from the hip, and she was prepared. Okay, so it was like when we go into a when we go to any meeting, it was there were uh, certainly you we were going to get our best all the time. Uh, Liz, uh, again, when uh, I think my memories of everybody, I, I look through the directors, and I look back through the hall here, and I, I see everybody, and it's it was put in perspective to a member at my last meeting when I was speaking, and, and the gentleman walks up to me and he says, "Dave," he says, 
I want to tell you something. He says, would you believe me? This gentleman has served our country. He has a master's degree. He's now working for the Department of Public Utilities. He says, Dave, you're, you've worked for the city five years longer than I've been alive. <laughs> I thought, oops. <laughs> I mean, that says something. I never thought 37 years was, was a long time until they put it in that perspective. But uh, it was serving people. It, it was fighting for workers' rights and, and all the rights, and we do appreciate that. We were trained well. I want to thank all the board members. Uh, um, I'm my proud family. My, my son's a local 24 sheet metal journeyman. So he's come through the apprentice program. I think it's important that we, that we get those folks out there. Uh, my daughter, uh, mother of three, uh, we call him Cooper, uh, the two-year-old wonder. Uh, you know, she's got a two-year-old, a seven-year-old, and my 13-year-old grandson, she took it upon herself to go back to college. She's, she, she's back there, she's going to nursing school, and she graduates in May. Uh, our, our youngest daughter can't be here today, Melissa Rose, and who hasn't sat down with me you know, at any level and not heard a, a story about my children, okay? Because it's important that if you know my children and my family, and my co-workers, then you know who I am. My grandson. <laughs> so with that said, thank you so much. Uh, you know, the city's going to do well, with, with or without me. But I'll be here. I'm just taking a little bit of time off. But I'll be back, okay? <laughs> my, oh, my wife. This is my wife. Uh, <laughs> I didn't tell anything. Now, I listen. no introduction. Uh, uh, 40... 40 Four years yeah. uh, of marriage. Uh, we started dating in high school, so that you add that, that's like 50 years. That's almost as old as we, I am, I guess. So, so, and, and she's been by my side the whole time. She's uh, also a union card-carrying member. So, and she works at Southwestern City Schools in mm -hmm. Grove City. So, ED. So that's a job in itself. Thank you so much. Thank we, you. Uh, it's quite Thank an honor. Have you have you found that? Uh, camper yet no i'm still okay. looking <laughs> all right well are there any other questions questions or comments from my colleagues seeing none i move for passage Second. brown brown doran's favor remy president harden thank you And finally this evening, I'd like to announce that my office and I will be hosting uh, our next community hours on Tuesday, March 19th at the Tim Hortons at 505 East Livingston Avenue from 530 to 7. And that is all I have this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Next Council Member, Council Member Favor. Thank you, President Hardin. I'd like to invite Chief Kimberly Spears McNatt to the podium. Tonight, I have resolution 85X-2019 to recognize March as National Women's History Month and to celebrate the accomplishments of Chief Kimberly Spears McNatt on becoming the first female police chief of The Ohio State University. Whereas in 1987, after being petitioned by the National Women's History Project, Congress passed Pub L 100-9, which designated the month of March 1987 as Women's History Month. Between 1988 and 1994, Congress passed additional resolutions requesting and authorizing the President to proclaim March of each year as Women's History Month. Since 1988, U.S. Presidents have issued annual proclamations designating the month of March as Women's History Month. And whereas on January 1st, 2019, Kimberly Spears McNatt became the first African-American female chief at The Ohio State University's, the 11th police chief, and made history. Chief Spears McNatt has served the university community as a police officer for nearly 25 years and was named deputy chief in August 2016. She is a member of the National Organization of the Black Law Enforcement Executives, the Ohio Association of Chiefs of Police, and the International Association of Campus Law Enforcement and Administrators. During Chief Spears McNatt's tenure, the Ohio State University Police Department has, she has received several honors, including a commendation award and a Medal of Valor. 
Spears McNatt received her bachelor's degree in criminal justice from The Ohio State University and earned her master's degree from Franklin University and has made the safety of our campus community her top priority and is looking forward to moving the agency forward with a focus on education and community engagement. Now, thor now therefore be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby recognize the accomplishments and contributions of Chief Kimberly Spears McNatt and does hereby declare the month of March 2019 as National Women's History Month in the City of Columbus. So I have known Chief Kimberly Spears McNatt for uh, quite a long time. I met her when I was an undergraduate student at The Ohio State University. And she has watched me grow. I have watched her grow into this role. And this is incredibly um, moving for me to be able to present you with this resolution. I don't know anyone more deserving and uh, more humble uh, to be put in such an honorable position. Uh, congratulations. Are there any comments from my colleagues? Yes. I won't embarrass you, Chief. You know me better than that. <laughs> We've known each other for a very long time, and I have to say congratulations, undeniably. Um, the achievement that she has risen to at uh, The Ohio State University is very, very special. Uh, she stands now on the shoulders of others, Craig Stone being one. And we can look forward to an improvement in the quality of the individuals who serve for Chief McNabb. I know her dedication. I know her engagement. I know her knowledge base. And I can't think of a better person to take on the responsibilities of being Chief of Police for the Ohio State University. Congratulations, Kimberly. Thank you so much. Chief, are there any comments for you? Um, first, I just want to thank you both for your kind words, and I just have a few comments. Um, first, I want to thank City, City of Columbus for recognizing me here today, in turn, shining the spotlight on all women in law enforcement. I did not start this journey alone. I want to thank my best friend and former OSU police officer, Kathy Amerson Johnson. Kathy and I started this journey together almost 25 years ago, and Kathy has been a steady influence in my life. I am thankful, I am grateful, and I am blessed. Columbus is one of the best cities in the world and home to a world-class university. It is the university that I attended as a student, and I take the responsibility of keeping all Buckeyes safe very seriously. This is now my agency and I have the ability to work with law enforcement on a local, state, and national level to get the job done. I have been fortunate enough to have both women and men mentors, especially Chief Craig Stone. Likewise, I have witnessed colleagues like former Columbus Chief Kim Jacobs blaze a pathway for other female officers and women in law enforcement. I am forever grateful to my mom and dad for teaching me the importance of a good work ethic. My godparents for instilling in me the importance of a good education. Many of you know that recently Tracy Hahn rejoined our police division as deputy chief. This is a coming home story for Tracy, who also started her career at OSU PD before eventually becoming the first female chief of Upper Arlington. Ohio State is, unique place, is a unique place with three strong female leaders. Our Director of Public Safety, Dr. Monica Mole, leads the way for safety on our campus and is the former chief of Bowling Green. Like many, Ohio State values diversity and strives to mirror the community that we serve. Finally, I want to thank my husband, Vince McNatt, and my son, Colin McNatt, for all their support. They get to see me at my best, and they get to see me at my worst, and they keep me humble. My personal and professional philosophy is to whom much is given, much is required. I am honored to represent Ohio State moving forward and continue the great collaboration with the City of Columbus Police and all law enforcement, law enforcement partners, and thank you for this opportunity to be recognized today. Thank you.
Thank you, Chief. At this point, I would like to move for adoption of the resolution. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy, President Hardin. Once again, thank you. Tonight, I also have resolution 90X-2019 to recognize the City of Columbus's support for increased revenue for infrastructure, transportation, and transit, funding to create jobs and pave the way for Ohio's future. I would like to call Asleen Rodriguez, co-founder and CEO of Empower Bus to the podium. Whereas on Monday, March 4th, Mayor Ginther, Columbus City Council, and community leaders united in support in the major increasing in infrastructure and transportation funding. And based on recent proposals, the Ohio Department of Transportation estimates Columbus and Central Ohio communities could receive tens of millions in new funding for infrastructure and transportation. And in addition to ensuring our roads and bridges are safe, Ohio must prioritize substantial new investment in transit to effectively connect residents to jobs, health care, and education. Council is committed to creating opportunities for residents, and this significant level of investment would create thousands of jobs. And now is the opportune time for the State House to increase infrastructure funding and prioritize transit and transportation innovation. Ms. Rodriguez, do you have any uh, comments today? Yes. Good evening, President Brown, President Pro Tem, President Hardin, President Pro Tem Brown, and members of council. Thank you for this opportunity to speak in favor of the proposed increase to the state tax. With 11.7 million people, Ohio ranks seventh in population among U.S. states. It has the fourth largest interstate system in the country, the second largest inventory of bridges, and the sixth highest number of vehicle miles traveled. However, we rank 40th in the nation in per capita transit funding. We do need to think about how well our bridges and roads are maintained. We also need to think about how we move people to and from work, education, and healthcare in our communities in an efficient, dignified, and reliable way. It should not be a crime in Ohio not to own a car, and yet that is how many working poor feel. At Empower Bus, we talk about access and equity. The gas tax increase has the ability to improve upward mobility for Columbus residents. It is important that we not only increase the gas tax, but that a significant portion of the gas tax increase is allocated to, for transit funding. Traditional public transportation systems and new forms of microtransit have the ability to efficiently connect all citizens to work, healthcare, and education opportunities impacting social mobility for all residents. Thank you for issuing this resolution. Thank you for being here. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Thank you, uh, Councilmember Faye, for bringing this resolution, and thank you to Azaleen uh, and to Empower Bus for the work that you're doing uh, in creating equity uh, in transportation and workforce. <clears throat> I just uh, returned from D.C. a couple hours ago, uh, where I joined uh, Councilmember Tyson uh, and members of the National League of Cities advocating for uh, infrastructure uh, support on the federal on the federal level. The thing is, though, that we can't wait in states and cities for the federal government to act. We must do so ourselves, and so that's why we join uh, with Council Member, our President, with Mayor Ginther and many other mayors and community leaders around the state uh, to advocate uh, on behalf of uh, the gas tax. Uh, this will allow for a meaningful investment uh, in the city, uh, and we look forward to its passage. Uh, and so I, again, thank you, uh, Council Member Favor, for your advocacy. Uh, and for all of us for, for bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Hardin. At this time, I'd like to move for adoption of the resolution. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy, President Hardin. Thank you so much.
And lastly, uh, President Hardin, I just would like to announce our community hours for the month of March. Uh, Wednesday, March 20th, uh, from 9.30 to 11 a.m., we will be at the Starbucks, uh, located at 2560 Bryce Road. On Friday, March 22nd, from 3.30 to 5 p.m., we will be at the Columbus Metropolitan Library, the Parsons Branch. Tuesday, March 26th, from 3.30 to 5, uh, we will be at the Milo Grogan Community Center. And then to close out the month of March, uh, March 28th, from 11.30 to 1 p.m., we will be at the library, the Whetstone Branch. That is all. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Dorrance. Let's welcome Councilman Dorrance's to his first council meeting. <laughs> I have the final resolution, and at this time I'd ask uh, Mr. Marshall Short, uh, Pastor Victor Davis, Dana Messner, and Willis Brown to come forward. Today we are, are honoring the history of one of our historic neighborhoods in Columbus, Bronzeville, a neighborhood that was founded just east of downtown Columbus and filled with black residents in the 1900s. While the Harlem Renaissance was happening in New York, Columbus's east side, Bronzeville, was experiencing its own renaissance of culture and of music. In my office, I keep a redlining map from 1936 that illustrates the same area that was redlined. And despite redlining during the 20th century, Bronzeville was a center for arts, music, history, and culture for the African-American community. In fact, there were at least four Bronzeville cities across the country, in Chicago, in Milwaukee, in Columbus, and in Los Angeles, flourishing at this time. Tonight, I'm introducing Resolution 0084X-2019 to honor and recognize the history of Bronzeville and the anniversary of the first mayor of Bronzeville, Reverend N.L. Scarborough. Resolution 0084X-2019 reads as follows. Whereas the city, of Bron uh, the city of Bronzeville was chartered and officially established October 1936 as a nonprofit organization intended to be a unifier and create civic sol solidarity among African Americans, Bronzeville boundaries were identified as to the south, East Broad Street, to the east, Woodland Avenue, to the west, Cleveland Avenue, and to the north, Pennsylvania. Uh, railroad tracks, and whereas Bronzeville elected its own mayor, Reverend N.L. Scarborough, senior pastor of Trinity Baptist Church, on March 3, 1937, out of at least 70 people who ran for the highly sought out position. And whereas Reverend Scarborough's inauguration featured Columbus Mayor Myron Gessman, who gave the opening inaugural address. During the inauguration, Mayor Scarborough named an all African American cabinet to address Bronzeville's social political, and economic needs. And whereas Bronzeville was the center of the, for arts and music for African-American artists in the 20th century and known as the Harlem of Columbus, famous musicians such as Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Nancy Wilson, James Brown, and hometown heroes, uh, Rashawn Roland Kirk and Harry Sweets Edison would perform in one of the many clubs around the area. So be it resolved by this council, of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby honor and recognize the history of Bronzeville and the anniversary of the first mayor of Bronzeville, Reverend N. L. Scarborough. Represented here tonight are uh, these four gentlemen who know so much about this history. Certainly, I want to recognize uh, Willis Brown for the work that he's done with our office over the last several months uh, and the deep education on this uh, issue uh, and being uh, living in the neighborhood uh, and hearing uh, day in, day out uh, from residents about our rich history, I thought it was important that we take this moment uh, and recognize uh, African-American culture in our community. And uh, with that, I will turn the, mic the podium over to uh, you gentlemen to speak on this resolution. Can we invite our other Bronzeville? Would love to, yeah, and but let's get started too though. Thank you. Mr. President, you have said most of what I was going to say, um, but as a Baptist preacher, I always have something to say. Um, first of all, let me thank you for this resolution and the work that many in our community have put forth to make sure that history remains alive in our community. Um, with the present uh, political climate across America, the need for equity and equality in our history is most important with the contributions of African-Americans and such and many other cultures to the United States 
It brings me great privilege and honor to be in the lineage heritage of pastoring Trinity Baptist Church, along with Shiloh Baptist Church, along with Union Grove Baptist Church in the Near East Side, particularly, and Second Baptist Church. Trinity has stood as one of those founding churches that represent the community with not only its members, such as Les Wright, who served on this board, uh, but uh, many others in this community, Priscilla Tyson growing up in Trinity, and others. It brings me great privilege to recognize the um, heritage and the contributions of our previous pastor, the right Reverend Dr. Nale Lale Scarborough, who served for 20 some years at the Trinity Baptist Church. One of the interesting things about the heritage of Trinity and Bronzeville is that all of Trinity's pastors have been from North Carolina, and three of us are graduates of the historically black college Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Prior to his death, he represented on the council speaking for the political climate of African Americans as they migrated in the great migration from the South, working to make Columbus a better place to live in the heart of America. I thank you, I recognize the contributions, and we will continue to represent Bronzeville with our heart, minds, and soul as a better place to live, work, play, and have our faith. God bless you. Good evening, President Hardin, President uh, Pro Tem Brown, and the rest of City Council. Uh, I don't know that I'm necessarily qualified um, to be speaking on behalf of Bronzeville, um, but I am honored to have words. Um, I can recall probably about 15 years ago um, as a student at CCAD, um, learning about the, the Near East Side, Bronzeville area uh, from a professor uh, by the name of Larry Collins. And I was introduced to this area through his work through art um, and I learned about uh, Mina Robinson. Um, so being a Cleveland native, a kid from Cleveland, um, and learning this history. Um, but I was walking down Long Street, I don't know where I was going, and uh, Mr. Brown was on the street. Uh, I don't know if he was preaching, uh, teaching, uh, scolding somebody, but, or all of the above. Um, but um, at, at that moment, I fell in love with this history. I, I couldn't sit it down. Uh, and so a lot of the work that I've done since then has been right there in that community on Long Street, on Mount Vernon. The art uh, that I've done has been in that community. Um, I started my business in that community, um, multiple initiatives in that community, um, in Bronzeville, um, and, and have a, a deeper connection even beyond Columbus, my dad being from Chicago, um, and learning of the connection between uh, Columbus and, and Chicago and some of the other cities um, and that Bronzeville history. And so no history is without its tainted uh, history. Um, and we know across the United States that uh, many cities were riddled with poverty, racism, colorism, and all of those things that have stood to uh, take down this history. But the erasure of that history uh, does, does no one any justice. So I'm very honored today that the city is recognizing this history. And I, I do want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Brown and Dana and so many others who have relentlessly for years before I even was a resident um, of this community uh, to push for this work for this moment and beyond. And so I'm honored, I'm a resident. I've, my wife and I um, eventually bought our home in this area. And so I'm, I'm excited about the future of Bronzeville, um, if you can't tell. I made, I made a shirt, one shirt um, for tonight, uh, just to wear. Um, but thank you, um, I'm honored, and God bless. Good evening, Council. Uh, Dana Masoner, I'm the Vice President of the Bronzeville Neighborhood Association. In this historic and historically African-American community, has always been multi-ethnic, multicultural, various demographics, economic, political, social, cultural. And it still is that way. It's one of the more diverse neighborhoods that we have. We want to keep it that way. Bronzeville was significant. Bronzeville is significant. And we think it will continue to play a very large role in the very nice collection of neighborhoods that make up Columbus. So thank you very much. So you don't have to worry about everyone else speaking. This is right to the point. Thank you again, uh, President Hardin, and now uh, Pro Tem, Pres uh, President uh, Brown, 
and members of co uh, council, I was going to say Congress, oh gosh. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I think with all of us, as, as we, in, the, in some of the uh, information, they would call themselves Bronzevillians, and they used to have a, a article called The Bronzeman in the paper. And, and I think in, in the research in the years, over 20 plus years that Dana and I have been working, looking for stuff, and on the microfish and searching for information, what's significant about Columbus? I'm from Harlem. And, you know, we would say, oh, Harlem, Harlem, yeah, we are good and we are right. But let me tell you, what happened here is very, not unique, but very exceptional. In all those other places, Bronze and Milwaukee, uh, Chicago, L.A., and now Columbus, it was here that the African Americans pooled their resources with other uh, uh, businesses to build buildings out of the ground. In America, the only thing that matters is your name and your property, and you can build a building. Look at Wexner, all the money he has, he's still putting his name on buildings. In Bronzeville, they understood that. So we have a, a street, a long street, that they honored the women for being the participant who managed the money that they raised. We have, there was the Bernadine, we have the Edna, the Margarita, the Teresa, all these are women who were very prominent in the uh, development of bronze at that time. And we were fortunate, Dana and I and, and others in bronze have met some of the original bronze villains who uh, told us the actual story uh, with James Madison as being the oldest at the time he's passed, but also Mrs. Walker, who's another one, who said that if the men came up with an idea to build a building, we, the women of Bronzeville, would not only design the spaceship, but create the fuel to send them. And that's why they honored them with names of buildings on Long Street. And we're going to continue that because it showed the, that women's live was already existing in Bronzeville back in the 20s and 30s because they respect that. And we, we want to continue the diversity because our, our neighborhood was designed to people to live in and move up and stay in the neighborhood. And we, we, we really don't, people get caught up in the gentrification, all this new stuff. Our attitude, as long as we are organized and have a purpose, we don't care who gets on the bus because we are driving the bus, working with the city. We have issues with gentrification if you're not organized. Are people going to come and protect their, their investment? We know the value of our neighbors, so we all are protecting our investments so that we can make it better for those who are not born yet and those who are coming. So we, we look forward to reaching out with the city, as did Mayor Gessaman with Mer uh, Reverend Scarborough. They worked together. If you read any of the documents, the Mayor Gessaman was so happy that Scarborough took the lead in bringing this together because he said, if they can handle that problem, that's the last thing that I have to do. And he supported them 100%. So we want to do the same in Bronzeville with, with Pastor Davis and other pastors in the neighborhood. And as collectively, we want to make Bronzeville a, a place that when you, when you say, hey, I'm from Bronzeville, I live there, I want to be there, you say, yeah, with a smile. So we're going to continue to work collectively and market and promote. And uh, we have our young marketeer there to learn and help us with creative things. And we all here are going to pitch in. And, and next year when we come back here just to visit City Council, we'll say, here's the new Bronzeville. And we say thank you and everyone for everything. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I move for, pass, for adoption. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, President Harden. Adopted. Congratulations. And I would like to recognize my staff member, Stanley Gates, who put a lot of time into working on this and doing the history. Thank you. Thank you. One more resolution. Just joking. We were off last week, so we have a lot of good things in the community to resolve. So thank you all for being a part of it. Um, are there any comments by our elected officials? Auditor, I see that we have Judge Barrows and Judge Thomas in the audience. Any comments? Perfect. At this time, I request that the following ordinance be removed from the consent action uh, portion of the agenda, uh, Recreation and Parks Ordinance 0480-2019 and 0481-2019. Are there any other requests uh, by members of council for removal of ordinance or resolutions from the consent action portion of the agenda? Seeing none, uh, may the clerk now ha uh, 
have the mo may I now have a, a motion to waive reading of the 30 day titles of legislation by the clerk? Thank you. Will the clerk now re read into the record the ordinance numbers of 30 day legislation? Finance Committee, ordinances 592, 594, 602, 607. 629-664-2019, Public Safety Committee Ordinance 637-2019, Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 151, 391, 418, 446, 512, 534, 536, 555, 601-2019, Technology Committee Ordinances 567, 570, 588-2019, Criminal Justice and Judiciary Committee Ordinances 577, 578, 579, 580, Dash 2019 Economic Development Committee Ordinance 673 Dash 2019 Zoning Committee Ordinances 597 598 653 677 595 and 596 Dash 2019. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have two speakers on the consent action portion uh, of the agenda. The first speaker is Mr. Nate Wilkins. Mr. Wilkins, welcome back to Council. Mr. Wilkins is speaking on Ordinance. Uh, 0684 2019, and he is speaking in favor. Welcome back to Council, Mr. Wilkins. Sixteen twelve Arlington Avenue, just a resident of the uh, North Linden area. Um, I'm not speaking against or in favor of this ordinance. Um, several questions before I say I'm for this ordinance. Um, I'd like to know. With the extension uh, of February 13th of 2019, and also February 13th of uh, 2020, I would like to see extension beginning up to, uh, to uh, beginning at February the 19th, uh, 2019 and two, 2038. I just want to know. What is Homeport extension and how long, why did we can't give extension more longer time for something like this? Um, I would like to see the extension to be extended to 2038. Just like to have more clarification on this. Thank you for your time. I'm also for this. Again. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. I'll have someone from uh, development please follow up with Mr. Wilkins uh, on ordinance uh, 0628, I believe, 0684. The next uh, speaker is Ms. Julie Watson, speaking in favor um, of ordinance 00, or, uh, resolution uh, 0051, that's 2019. Appointment. My name is Julie Watson, located at 404 South 3rd Street in Columbus. I'm a member of the Bread Organization, located at, um, at 404 South 3rd Street in Columbus. Sorry about that. We support having Ms. Diggs serve on the Housing Council. We've interacted with her and know that she has a heart for helping people find housing. I also share that passion. At the end of the school year, the attendant secretary at my school told me that there were over 200 times during the past school year when she entered a new student into our school building. We have over 500 students at our school and the turnover is great. Many of our families frequent local homeless shelters on a regular basis. The students' addresses change often when they have the luxury of not having to leave our school. Last year, one of my students started out the school year in a homeless shelter. By November, his family had found an apartment on the west side. He was in fourth grade and had been in a different school every year. His mom really liked our school and wanted to give her son some stability in his life. For the rest of the school year, we had to call his mom every day after recess to find out whether he was going to take the hour and 30 minute bus ride home to the west side or if he was supposed to walk to his auntie's house. There are many more stories about housing problems that families from my school have experienced. This is a big concern for families as well as the school staff when we see how many obstacles get in the way of our students' learning. Not having stable housing directly affects the child's education. We have shared our stories week after week. The ballot initiative and the land trust are good steps forward. 
Research shows that more funding is needed to address our housing crisis. Brad has two requests of the city. Number one, encourage developers to set aside new housing units for families that make less than $42,000 a year. And number two, give an additional $5 million per year to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. What would it take for the city to grant these requests? Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Uh, you, you yield back your time? What? You, I was just make sure you yield back your time. You had 49 seconds left. No, I'm done. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. The following ordinances appear on our agenda as consent action. Will the, the clerk now read those ordinances into the record? Resolutions of expression 86X, 79X, 80X, 81X, and 82X-2019. Finance Committee, ordinances 510, 533, 548, 556, 587, 646, 647, 656 2019. Recreation and Parks Committee, ordinances 421, 476, 497 2019. Public Safety Committee, ordinances 407, 443, 505, 560, 610, and 642 2019. Public Utilities Committee, Ordinances 201, 364, 367, 383, 387, 399, 408, 412, and 498 2019. Public Service and Transportation Committee, Ordinances 174, 535, 541, 550, 586, 600, and 611 2019. Housing Committee, Ordinances 684 and 685 2019. Criminal Justice and Judiciary Committee, Ordinances 447. 448, 544, 575, and 576 2019. Economic Development Committee, Ordinances 582, 674, and 683 2019. Small and Minority Business Committee, Ordinances 515, 516, 517, and 518 2019. Appointments from the Mayor's Office numbered A0036, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, and 51 2019. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, and seeing no uh, further speakings on the consent action portion of the agenda, may I have a motion to approve these items designated as consent? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Harden. Passed. We will now proceed with second reading portion of our agenda. The first committee to come before council is finance. That committee is chaired by President Pro Tem Brown. President Pro Tem, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Harden. Tonight in finance, we have ordinance 0504-2019 to authorize the finance and management director on behalf of the real estate management office to pay rent associated with existing lease agreements and an internal memorandum of understanding to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of $1,354,440 from the special income tax fund and to declare an emergency. The rent payments authorized by this ordinance cover seven existing lease agreements providing office space for the municipal court, the departments of development and public safety, and an internal memorandum of understanding with the Department of Public Utilities. Emergency action is being considered to allow for the timely payment of rent for each of these lease agreements. Seeing no questions from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Uh, next, Ordinance 0519-2019 to authorize an appropriation within the Community Development Block Grant to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to enter into a contract on behalf of the Office of Construction Management with BBCO Design for design services related to the construction of neighborhood education facility and to authorize the expenditure of $1,794,924 from the CDBG fund and to declare an emergency. This ordinance authorizes the first steps to construct a new neighborhood education facility on the hilltop. I wanna thank Director Rhonda Johnson and Deputy Director Matt Smido for spearheading this project um, and for their ongoing work increasing access to high quality pre-K classrooms for children in Columbus. I say it often, but it bears repeating often, um, that increasing access to high quality early childhood education is one of the best investments we can make as a city and as a society. Supporting places where parents can confidently take their pre-K children to learn and grow not only gives them the flexibility they need to work and provide for their family, but it also helps prepare our kids for success in school and in life. 
We recognize that additional pre-K classrooms are needed in Columbus and the Hilltop is one of our neighborhoods most in need. This new facility is a substantial investment to help meet that need. Emergency action is being considered so that design work may begin as soon as practical. Any questions from colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy, President Harding. Pass. President Harden, may I move to recreational Please. parks? Uh, these next two ordinances are on consent, uh, removed from consent on page 11. Uh, they are to modify and extend contracts with Community for New Directions and the Columbus Urban League to continue their work with the Neighborhood Violence Intervention Program through APPS. The Applications for Purpose, Pride, and Success program was created in 2011 with the goal of reducing crime and violence in the lives of Columbus youth through proven prevention and intervention strategies. At the heart of the work are outreach professionals who build relationships with at-risk youth. These intervention specialists connect with individuals and provide resources to steer them away from choices that might ultimately lead to violence. City Council continues to prioritize funding for community-based intervention strategies to reduce violence in our neighborhoods. APPS is a major component of these efforts. We know that policing alone will not solve the problem of violence. Last year, City Council committed funding for two new violence intervention specialists with the APPS program. These additions provide the capacity to connect with and help more individuals in our neighborhoods. We also provided funding for a new Cap City Nights Festival in the Wedgwood community. Cap City Nights helps empower neighborhoods to build trust and a stronger sense of community to help reduce violence. In addition to the prevention work, it's crucial to provide services to individuals, families, and communities who experience violence-related trauma. And we do this through the CARE Coalition. Last year, this council funded an additional social worker on the staff of the CARE Coalition to augment their efforts. I want to thank uh, Tony Collins, Eric Brandon, and Mario Martin, and all the staff involved with the APPS program. I look forward to continuing to partner with you as we extend and improve the impact of this important work in our neighborhoods. Director Collins, would you like to touch on any of the key enhancements under these new contracts that we're actually introducing tonight? Thank you, President Pro Tem. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, Council President Hardin, members of Council, uh, we're very pleased with this new iteration of the scope for the APPS intervention work. Uh, we've been working very closely with our partners as well as our own team on an evaluation process. We've identified some areas that we believe that we want to address and lift up in the agreement, and this uh, scope reflects those things, including additional collaboration uh, through uh, creating new mutual uh, I'm sorry, mutually supportive collaborations with internal and external start stakeholders, targeted resources approach towards uh, embedding project personnel into some of our more challenged and needing neighborhoods. Uh, we're looking at uh, increased and better data collection. This is a huge uh, component of this new, or this new revised agreement. We want better data submitted to us uh, through uh, matter logs, quarterly reports, and as well as a, a uniform system of creating and collecting that data. Uh, we're looking at staff improvement. Uh, we're increasing and addressing a requirement of 40 hours of mandatory staff training time. And finally, uh, reducing splintering between the agencies that we work with. As you know, we have two separate agreements uh, and our own internal team. And thanks again, uh, Councilmember Brown, all of council members for the support, uh, the additional support last year, uh, much needed and it's been very helpful. So we're trying to connect all those things through weekly case review meetings, as well as standardized data collection that I mentioned earlier, uh, and increasing our 24 hour on call approach uh, through this collaborative. Uh, so this is, these are just some of the components. Uh, we'll definitely uh, be sitting down and briefing a few of you on some more of the detail. Thank you, Director Collins. Um, training, uh, reporting, um, and communication. So those are really good enhancements for the contract. I appreciate the hard work that your team um, and you went through. Any questions from colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Oh, I'm sorry. I got a, got a little more work to do on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, first, uh, we'll do the Community for New Directions Ordinance, Ordinance 0480-2019. 
to authorize the Director of Recreation and Parks to modify and extend a contract with Community for New Directions for professional and fiscal services related to the implementation of the Neighborhood Violence Intervention Program to authorize the expenditure of $329,450 from the Recreation and Parks Operating Fund and to declare an emergency. I move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Amend it. And I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Pass. And the second one is the Columbus Urban League. Uh, Ordinance 0481-2019 to authorize the Director of Recreation and Parks to modify and extend a contract with the Columbus Urban League pro for professional and fiscal services related to the implementation of the Neighborhood Violence Intervention Program to authorize the expenditure of $329,450 from the Recreation and Parks Operating Fund and to declare an emergency. I first move to amend as submitted to the clerk. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Amend it. And I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. Council President, I have two Rec and Parks related in rules and reference. Please. May I move to that? Thank you. Ordinance 0313-2019 to amend section 919.13 of the city code to grant the director of recreation and parks the authority to allow for the sale, service, and or consumption of alcoholic beverages at Franklin Park when used as an event venue. Council amended city code in 2017 to grant the Director of Recreation and Parks authority to set policy and guidelines for the sale of alcoholic beverages at major event venues. The original language limited the sale of alcohol in Franklin Park exclusively to the Adventure Center. Most sales during special events take place from tents or trailers set up on the grounds, so this revision clarifies that the sale of alcohol can occur at Franklin Park more broadly outside of the Adventure Center during approved special events. Any questions from colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Pass. And my final ordinance of the night, 0521-2019, to amend section 921.01 through uh, 09 of the Columbus City Code to grant the Director of Recreation and Parks the authority to authorize third-party vendors to conduct commercial activity in city-controlled waterways waterways via written permission rather than bid and contract, including the rental of canoes, kayaks, paddle boards, and similar vessels, and to declare an emergency. Um, and uh, the goal of this code revision is to expand the number of vendors available to residents who are interested in renting paddle craft on city-operated waterways, primarily the downtown pool of the Scioto River. Any and all qualified vendors may be granted permission as long as they meet the strict rules, guidelines, and qualifications that will be developed to ensure potential boaters receives a high level of service and safety. Emergency action is being considered in order to implement these new policies in time for nice weather, hoping very soon, uh, when people would want to be on the river in a boat. Any questions? <laughs> other than when the nice weather will happen, okay. yes. <laughs> which I wish I had answers for. Uh, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. That's all I have, Council President. Thank you, Chair Brown. Oh. Next committee to come before Council is the Public Utilities Committee. Uh, that committee is chaired by Councilmember Dorns. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, President Hardin. Uh, tonight in Public Utilities, we have one piece of legegislation, that's Ordinance uh, 395-2019, uh, to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into an engineering agreement with Burgess Nipple Inc. for the uh, Jackson Pike Wastewater uh, Treatment Plant screening improvements, to authorize the transfer within the expenditure of up to $787,950 from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund, and to amend the 2018 Capital Improvement Budget. Uh, the Jackson Pike Wastewater Treatment Plant Screen Improvement Project will ensure that debris will continue to be removed from the incoming wastewater disposal. Uh, the Jackson Pike facility operates two different screening channels and re related equipment. Uh, these screening rooms were actually originally built in the 1930s. Um, the screening improvements will ensure that the debris continues to be removed from the incoming wastewater for disposal. 
Uh, the effective removal of this debris is essential to ensure the wastewater treatment process that benefits uh, everyone here in Columbus and across the Central Iowa region. If there are no questions from my colleagues or, or comments, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy, President Hardin. Passed. But all you have in your committees, Chairman? Yes. All right, thank you. The next committee to come before council is the Public Service and Transportation Committee. Uh, that committee is chaired by Councilmember Favor. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Hardin. Tonight in Public Service and Transportation, we have Ordinance Number 532-2019 to authorize the city attorney to file complaints in order to immediately appropriate and accept the remaining fee simple and lesser real estate necessary to timely complete the arterial street rehabilitation Hamilton Road I-70 to refugee public improvement project and to declare an emergency. The city's acquisition of the real estate will help make, prove, improve, or repair certain portions of the public right of way of Hamilton Road between refugee road and I-70 which will be open to the public without charge. The city must acquire absolute ownership of property located within the vicinity of Hamilton Road in order for the Department of Public uh, Safety to timely complete the public project. Are there any questions from my colleagues? I would move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. And uh, next we have ordinance number 566-2019 to amend the 2018 capital improvements budget to authorize the chief innovation officer to execute a professional services contract with Siemens Mobility relative to Smart Columbus common payment system project to authorize the expenditure up to 1.8 million from the streets and highways bond fund to pay for the expenditure and to declare an emergency. Uh, we do have the uh, Director of Office of Innovation, uh, Mr. Michael Stevens, present. Would you like to make some comments? Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Favor, President Hardin, members of Council. As we work to ensure that we utilize changing technology and mobility to remove barriers and provide equity and access to all our residents, the Smart Columbus Program Office has selected Siemens Mobility to assist in developing a common payment system that will enhance our multimodal trip planning application that is currently being developed. This will allow for seamless travel planning and payment experience. Siemens was selected because it provides a provides relationships with retail locations to enable mobile cash transit loads onto a user's common payment system account at local retailers. Siemens is a payment card industry data security standard compliant service provider so that the payment data is secure. And Siemens, Siemens works with existing mobi mobility providers which will allow the city to leverage these relationships. This ordinance authorizes an expenditure of up to $1.8 million which will be considered part of the city's cost share commitment to the U.S. Department of Transportation. Thank you for your support of Smart Columbus, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Thank you. If not, I would move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have ordinance number 569-2019 to authorize the city attorney to file complaints in order to immediately appropriate and accept the remaining fee simple and lesser real estate necessary to complete the SRTS Sidewalks McGuffey and Duxbury project and to declare an emergency. In order for the city's Department of Public Service to complete the public project in a timely manner, the city must acquire the property located in the vicinity of Duxbury Avenue from Lexington Avenue to Hamilton Avenue. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, I'd move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have uh, ordinance number 630-2019 to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into professional service contract modifications with CTL Engineering and Prime Construction Management and survey for the roadway improvements, construction inspection, and materials testing 2018 project to authorize the expenditure up to 500,000 from the private construction inspection fund and up to 500,000 from the 
Public Construction Management and Inspection Fund to pay for these contract modifications and to declare an emergency. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, I'd have moved for passage. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Thank you. And last in public service, we have Ordinance Number 654-2019 to amend the 2018 Capital Improvement Budget to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into a professional services contract with DLZ Ohio for the Arterial Street Rehabilitation State Route 161-I-71 to Cleveland Avenue Phase 1 project to authorize the expenditure up to $250,000 from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund to pay for this contract and to declare an emergency. The intent of this project is to improve uh, and to provide the City of Columbus Division of Design and Construction additional resources involving the preparation of preliminary engineering documents and detailed design plans for the first of multiple phases targeted to improve safety and increase multimodal access throughout the state route 161 corridor between I-71 and Cleveland Avenue. Director, do you have any comments? President Hardin, Pro Tem Brown, Chair Favor, other members of council, thank you for uh, bringing this up this evening. I just wanted to add that this will be the, like you said, phase one, there'll be three phases. This, this first phase is from Maple Canyon to Cleveland and then we'll continue on with the other phases um, as we progress through this phase one project and as funding allows. So thank you very much, and hopefully we'll be back with the other two phases soon. Thank you, Director. Are there any comments or questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you, Director Hardin. That is it for the Public Service and Transportation Committee. Uh, may I move on to uh, criminal justice and judiciary? Sure. Thank you. Uh, tonight we have ordinance number 449-2019 to authorize and direct the city auditor to transfer 340,000 from the general fund to the specialty docket program for the Franklin County Municipal Court. The Municipal Court operates five specialized dockets which have been certified or are in the process of receiving certification from the Supreme Court of Ohio commissioned on specialized docket. There are five judges that preside over the specialized dockets, Judges Moore, Hart, Herbert, Barrows, Tyek, and Thomas. I would like to call Judge Barrows and Judge Thomas is also um, in chambers this evening as well to the podium. Thank you very much, Council President Hardin, uh, Chair Favor, and members of Council. <clears throat> this is not new. You have been collectively helping the court save lives for about 10 or 12 years now. It's a, it's a cooperation with the county. It also pays $340,000 each year to assist that. We also reach out for grants from other um, agencies to augment that, and each of the specialized dockets has some special sources of assistance for the people that we serve. But I wanted to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for the support that you've given to these life-saving efforts of the court to change people's lives, to take them out of the criminal justice system, and to help them to return to being productive citizens. I would like to introduce my colleague, Judge Jody Thomas. Judge Thomas. Thank you. Good evening, Council President Hardin, Chair Favor, and members of Council. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Uh, I can tell you that I've been part of the specialized docket since their inception in 2004, um, actually as the Franklin County Public Defender that represented the participants in these programs. Now I'm one of the presiding judges over the HEART program. It stands for Helping Achieve Recovery Together. That is our opiate-specific uh, drug court. And I can't thank you enough for the support because these programs are saving lives. Um, I know that what we're working on in the HEART program is not only helping people get clean and off of these dangerous drugs, but working on those barriers that are preventing them from being in recovery and staying in recovery. We're working on transportation, housing, employment opportunities, um, getting their children back. So I know that every week I'm one of the judges as well as Judge Barrows working hard with these participants um, to get them through the criminal, criminal justice system uh, with some dignity and living a life of recovery um, and back as productive citizens of our community. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you both for the work that you're doing, um, just not in municipal court, uh, but as well with these specialty dockets. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? 
Seeing none, I would move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, very you all. Much. And last but not least, we have ordinance number 574-2019 to authorize and direct the city attorney to settle the case of Heather Hedges, dash large, first city of Columbus, pending before the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas to authorize the expenditure of $78,813.65 in payment of the settlement and to declare an emergency. Uh, tonight, we have Assistant City Attorney Josh Cox uh, in chambers, if you'd like to make some comments about the case. Thank you, Chair Favor, President Hardin, members of council. This is a, an employment-related case filed by a uh, employee of the Department of Public Safety Division of Police against the city. Uh, this employee was a, a police officer who was injured during her uh, 2013 shotgun requalification, uh, resulting in uh, the injury that uh, led her to a civilian appointment within the division uh, and ultimately to a uh, modified work schedule um, with a medical restriction. When that uh, status was not, was not given permanently and the employee was not uh, allowed to fill vacant positions uh, for part-time positions within the division, uh, she resigned and this lawsuit followed. The question then for the uh, case was whether the city uh, complied with its legal obligation to reasonably accommodate an employee with a known disability uh, unless the city can show that the accommodation would uh, impose an undue hardship on the city's uh, conduct of city business. Uh, after extensive discovery and discussion, uh, the parties reached a compromise on this uh, lawsuit and agreed to reinstatement of the employee to a part-time position and payment of back pay. Uh, the Department of Public Safety was involved in these discussions and on behalf of the department and the city attorney's office, we would request council's approval. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, I would move for passage. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Thank you, that is all for my committees this evening. Thank you, Chair Favor. The next committee to come before council is the Economic Development Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Remy. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Council President Hardin. Tonight I have ordinance number 3221-2018 to authorize the Director of Deve Department of Deve Development to establish a fee schedule that supports the department's administration, administrative and project costs associated with administering department programs and to declare an emergency. Through the use of targeted programs and incentives, the Department of Development encourages the development of affordable housing, the creation of new and retained jobs, leverage private investment, and the enforcement of the city code. The purpose of this ordinance is to establish fee schedules that support the administrative and project costs associated with the administering these programs. Fee schedules have been developed for the following divisions within the Department of Development, Economic Development, Housing, Code Enforcement, and Land Redevelopment. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Next, I have ordinance number 0507-2019 to authorize the Director of Development of D the Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with Abbott Laboratories and Abbott Manufacturing Inc. for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of a total proposed capital investment of approximately $62 million, the retention of 428 full-time jobs, and the creation of 38 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately 2,315,000. Abbott Laboratories is a global and broad-based healthcare company devoted to the discovery, development, manufacture, and man marketing of pharmaceuticals, nutritionals, and medical products, including devices and diagnostics. Abbott is proposing to invest project costs of, to of approximately $62 million, which include $11,741,000 in real property improvements, $49,615,000 in machinery and equipment, and $644,000 in standalone computers to expand its manufacturing site by constructing a freestanding facility 
consisting of approximately 25,000 square feet at 585 Cleveland Avenue. With this expansion, the company proposes to replace its existing two ounce bottle manufacturing line with a new filling and sterilization system. It would increase its line capacity from 157 to 250 million units per year and address the risk of equipment failure of its existing soon to be obsolete two ounce line. Additionally, Abbott will retain 428 full-time employees with an estimated annual payroll of $28.81 million and create 38 net new full-time pos permanent positions with an es associated estimated annual payroll of approximately $2,315,000 at the proposed site. This is a competitive process. In order for us to compete and retain these 428 jobs and the 38 new net new jobs, we have to compete against other plants around the country that Abbott owns and operates. And so therefore, that's why we come forth with this legislation. Um, does, uh, do you have any comments this evening from the Department of Development? Okay. If there are no questions or comments from my, co oh, I'm sorry. I do have one speaker this evening. It is Joe Motiel. Mr. Motiel, welcome back to council. You have three minutes. Please uh, state your name and where you're located. President Harden, Pro Tem Brown, uh, Chair Reby. Uh, members of the City Council, Joe Motil. I reside at 167 West Cook Road in Columbus, Ohio. Whether it's tax abatements for luxury real estate developers that build apartments and condos in blighted, distressed neighborhoods like the Short North that rent for nearly $5,000, or in this case, yet another Fortune 500 company with well-established roots in Columbus, everyone who is swimming in cash is asking for a handout because that is the Columbus way. And they all know that city council and the mayor are all about making sure that the Columbus way gets done their way, or it's the highway for you and your political careers are over. After you will undoubtedly pass this $2.5 million tax abatement to what I consider to be a very important healthcare company that provides numerous health benefits to people all over the world, city council will have given away $121.1 million in tax abatements to local Fortune 500 companies and their subsidiaries over nearly the last three years. For instance, 10.4 million to UPS, the largest package delivery company in the world, and $12.8 million to Big Lots so they could move even farther away from where their employees live, making transportation more expensive and difficult while keeping workers away from their families even longer. But the true mother load of tax abatements goes to cover my meds for nearly 78 million. Cover My Meds is the subsidiary of the sixth largest company in the world, the McKesson Corporation, that also holds the disgraceful honor of being arguably the number one pill dumper of opioids in the United States. And you can go ahead and try to convince the public that Abbott Labs was in talks with the suburbs or another city, and they were going to move on if they didn't get their measly $2.5 million tax break or that this tax abatement is a good trade-off because of the jobs it's going to create, and our income tax revenues may be in decline, so this will help. These tax abatement savings to these Fortune 500 companies, their subsidiaries, and others is what pays for their CEOs and board members, higher bonuses and salaries, luxury vacations, and other non-essentials. But these tax abatements are not small and measly to the working families and needs of Columbus residents. As the president of the Columbus Education Association recently stated, quote, rather than handouts to wealthy corporations, when the city and district approve huge tax breaks for corporations that don't need them, they drain our schools of resources and shift the burden to individual taxpayers, unquote. Abbott Labs doesn't need a tax abatement to be profitable. This unwarranted tax abatement entitlement frenzy that the Columbus Way and the Columbus Way has got to stop. After you approve this tax abatement this evening, City Council will have handed out $264,603,415 in tax giveaways over the last 41 months, and that is excluding the blank check 15-year 100% tax abatements that were given to Wagenbrenner for their quarry project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Motil. Appreciate you coming down. Next, we have ordinance number zero. F oh, I'm sorry. I, I take uh, any comments or questions from my colleagues. Then, seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy, President Hardin. Passed. 
And next we have ordinance number 545, 2019, to authorize the Director of Development, Department of Devel Development to enter into a dual rate jobs growth incentive agreement with Filter Systems Company, LLC, for a term of up to five consecutive years in consideration of the company's proposed capital investment of $590,000 and creation of 10 new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $600,000. Filter Systems Company, LLC, provides custom-engineered industrial filtration and separation products, systems, and technology for the metalworking, water and wastewater, chemical, industrial, minerals, and steel industries. It is a part of CNI Commercial or the Chickasaw Nation Industries, a minority-owned business. Filter Systems Company, LLC, is proposing to invest approximately $20,000 in real property investments, $500,000 in machinery and equipment, $10,000 in furniture and fixtures, $50,000 in inventory, and $10,000 in technology to establish manufacturing operations at 1720 West Belt Drive. With this project, the company plans to lease an approximately 14,000 square foot facility to support a manufacturing operation. It will create 10 new full-time positions with a cumulative estimated annual payroll of approximately 600,000 to support its growth. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. Next, we have Ordinance 546, 2019, to authorize the Director of Deve Department of Deve Development to enter into a downtown office incentive agreement with Radiology Partners Management, LLC, for a term of up to five consecutive years in consideration of the company's proposed capital investment of 150000 the retention of 51 full-time jobs, and creation of 60 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $4.2 million. Radiology P Partners Management is the largest physician-led and physician-owned radiology practice in the U.S. with approximately 1,200 radiologists providing services to more than 850 hospitals, clinics, and imaging centers across 18 states with the infrastructure and capital to scale further. Radiology Partners Management is proposing to invest a total project cost of approximately $150,000, which includes $100,000 in leasehold improvements, $50,000 in furniture and fixtures to expand its existing operation and to establish a second corporate headquarters. Their um, investment will create 51 will retain 51 full-time jobs with an annual payroll of approximately $4,093,073 and create 60 net new full-time posi permanent positions with a cumulative estimated annual payroll of approximately $4.2 million. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Pass. Next, I have ordinance number 547, 2019, to authorize the department, director of the Department of Development to enter into a dual rate jobs growth incentive agreement with Vantage Point Logistics for a term of up to five consecutive years in consideration of the company's proposed capital investment of 275,000, the retention of 30 jobs and creation of 70 new net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately 4.2 million. Vantage Point Logistics is an Ohio-based IT company and the pioneer of a simple and proven method to reduce inbound package freight costs. Vantage Point Logistics is proposing to invest a total project cost of approximately $275,000, which includes $50,000 in leasehold improvements, $75,000 in standalone computers, and $150,000 in furniture and fixtures to expand its corporate headquarters at 1105 Shock Road. The Vantage Point Logistics will retain 30 full-time jobs with an annual payroll of approximately $2 million and create 70 net new full-time permanent positions with a cumulative estimated annual payroll of approximately $4.2 million to support its strategic growth initiative. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Yes. Just one comment, Councilman Remy. Um, just wanted to commend you and the, and the department um, for the last three job uh, incentive agreements. Uh, one of the questions that I, I asked you and the department to provide was what kind of uh, benefits are going to be provided to the workers. I just want to commend that all three agreements have commitments for both health care and other type of retirement benefits to be provided to those workers. So I just want to commend the department for making sure that folks are being taken care of. Thank you, Council Member Dorns. We really appreciate that, that feedback. Any other comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. 
Passed. Next, I have ordinance number 563, 2019, to authorize the Director of Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with Cloverleaf Cold Storage Company, LLC, and CCC. CCS Realty Property Owner LLC for a property tax abatement of 65% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of a proposed total investment of approximately 4.2 million in construction and real property improvements and expansion of their cold storage facility consisting of approximately 46,458 square feet, retention of 31 full-time jobs, and the creation of five new net full-time permanent positions. CCS Realty Property Owner, the, the property owner, and Cloverleaf Cold Storage Company, the employer of record, is one of the county's leading cold storage firms based in Sioux City, Iowa. Um, their proposed $4.2 million in construction of real property improvements and is going to expand their cold storage facility consisting of approximately 46,458 square feet. Um, this will retain 31 full-time employees with an annual payroll of approximately $1,210,143 and create five new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately 189798 are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. That's all I have in economic and development. With your permission, I'll move on to environment. Please. I, tonight I have an environment um, ordinance number 484, 2019, to authorize the expenditure of 16767000 or so, much thereof as may be necessary from the Special Income Tax Fund, to authorize the Director of Public Service to establish an encumbrance of 16747000 to pay re refuse tipping fees to the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio, also known as SWACO, for the Division of Refuse Collection Persu pursuant to an existing lease agreement to establish encumbrances up to $20,000 for tired disposal and construction demolition material disposal and to declare an emergency. This legislation authorizes the Director of Public Service to establish an encumbrance within the Special Income Tax Fund to pay 2019 waste disposal tipping fees for the Division of Refuse Collection and to expand funds to paying the tipping fees. This expense is necessary to safely and contractually dispose of the waste collected by the division in the course of pursuing its mission by providing residential refuse collection services to over 334,000 households weekly and picking up bulk items and illegally dump items as needed. Swaco tipping fees are determined by Swaco's established rate setting process. The vendors and waste disposal fees for tire disposal services and construction demolitions. Material disposal services will be determined through the city's competitive bidding process. I'd like to turn it over to the Director of Public Service, Director Gallagher, to talk a little bit more about this ordinance. President Hardin, Pro Tem Brown, Chair Remy, other members of council, thank you for allowing me to speak on this. I just wanted to um, add a little context around this. The $16.7 million is part of a larger $60 million budget, which is what we use to provide waste services to all the citizens of Columbus. This is approximately $180 per year per household. We continue to work through with Swaco and our other partners to become as efficient as possible and to bring this cost down. Some of the things that we've done in the past 12 months or so is one, we've implemented Route Smart, which is where we have used software to help us make sure our trucks are taking the most efficient routes possible to get to all those households. We've also started the process of changing over areas of town from 300 gallon containers to 90 gallon containers. Not only are those cheaper, but they're cheaper for us to service and they last a lot longer out in the elements. And then the last thing I wanted to bring about is we've been working closely with Director Lombardi and, and Fleet to make sure that we're using our fleet as long as possible and as efficiently as possible. So we're making changes there as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director. I just want to commend your work as well as the administrator's work um, on the fact that you know we're paying $15 a month on average um, for our households for this, and that includes everything that we do within uh, refuse and collection. So um, great work. It's it's one of the lowest um, that I know of in the state. Um, I know Councilmember Brown would like to say a couple words as well. Uh, Director Gallagher, could you also speak to the issue about tire disposal? Um, whenever I go to the hilltop, I get it bombarded with the issue about getting rid of tires. So uh, could you speak to that issue, please? 
I can, uh, Council Member Brown. So there are places in Columbus where you can drop off tires, and if you go to um, our website, you can find the locations on there. You can also call 311, and they're happy to tell you where those locations are. The problem is sometimes it's just too convenient to throw them into the alleys, into the back of, of other folks' yards, and what happens then is we have health issues and, and other issues. We are working very closely with Mayor Ginther on illegal dumping, and so we have been working our way around the city. We were able to take nine refuse drivers and turn them into what we're calling our illegal dumping staff, um, and they are going around the city in a systematic way to pick up all the illegal dumping, including tires, and what we're hoping to do is once we um, have these neighborhoods clean, that hopefully then people will take an effort to maintain that. We also are working very closely with police, and we have put up um, some cameras that we move around into these alleys to try to capture these illegal dumpers and prosecute them to the fullest. Uh, Director Gower, can you also make sure that the area commissions get that, all that information because a number of them were simply not aware of what was available to them, okay? Yep, I sure will do that. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll remind the council member that um, I'm going to be working on a PSA program to try to get the word out a little bit more uh, throughout this year. So um, are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you very much. And that's all I have tonight in environment. With your permission, I'll move on to Chair Tyson's committee, the Health and Human Services Committee. Please. Thank you very much. Tonight in Health and Human Services, I have Ordinance Number 531, 2019, to authorize the Board of Health to enter into contract with WBNS TV Inc. to continue a public awareness campaign to address obesity in Central Ohio, to authorize the total expenditures of $75,000 from the Health Special Revenue Fund, to waive the competitive bidding provisions on Columbus City Code, and to declare an emergency. Columbus Public Health is seeking to continue our partnership with 10TV's Commit to Be Fit, the only media-driven public awareness campaign in Central Ohio developed to improve the health of our community. In partnership with Metro Parks, Giant Eagle, and the YMCA of Central Ohio, Columbus Public Health will inform viewers and readers with practical hands-on inf information utilizing 10TV's Facebook, Twitter page, on-air news and on-air promotional spots providing them with education they can use to help make necessary changes to live healthier, active lives. This ordinance authorizes the Director of Board of Health to enter into the $75,000 contract with WBNS for a media-driven public awareness campaign in Central Ohio to improve the health of our community for a period of from March 1st, 2019 through February 29th, 2020. This ordinance waives the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. And that's all I have this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Remy. The final committee to come before council is a small and minority business committee. I am uh, honored and thrilled to be uh, regain the chairmanship of this committee. Uh, so the first ordinance to come before uh, Council is 0513-2019 to authorize the Director of Development to enter into a contract with the Capital Crossroads Special Improvement District of Columbus for the implementation of services set forth in the district plan to authorize and direct the City Auditor to appropriate and expend up to $3,100,000 from assessments levied from property owners and to declare an emergency. Uh, in 1999, the Capital South Community Urban Redevelopment Corporation, or the Greater Columbus and the Greater Columbus Chamber of Commerce and the Columbus Department of Trade and Development, initiated an effort to work with downtown property owners to create a special improvement district, or a SID, in the core area of downtown. Property owners were surveyed and overwhelmingly supported the creation of this SID. The SID was created. For, five year, for a five-year period and was reauthorized for an additional five-year period in 2006, in 2011, and in 2016. The SID provides beautification and safety services to the western parts of downtown. We're very grateful for their engagement in our city. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. The next ordinance is 0514-2019 to authorize the Director of the Development to enter into contract with the Discovery Special Improvement District of Columbus 
<coughs> excuse me, <coughs> for implementation of services set forth in the district plan to direct the city auditor to appropriate and expend up to $1 million from assessments levied from property owners and declared emergency. In 20, 2003, the Discovery District Development Corporation asked Capital South Community Urban Development Redevelopment Corporation to initiate an effort to work with the Discovery District property owners to create a special improvement district uh, on the east side of downtown. This SID was created for an initial five-year period and reauthorized in 2010 and again in 2015. Are there any questions by members of council? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, <coughs> President Hardin. Passed. Uh, next ordinance coming for council is 540-2019. Uh, it's to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to, pay, to make payment to the Capital Crossroads SIV for the second year of a three-year sponsorship commitment agreement to participate in the downtown CPAS program to authorize the appropriation of funds within the Capital South Fund to authorize the expenditure of $113,453 within the general fund, the street construction maintenance and repair fund, the development service fund, and the Capital South Fund and to de declare an emergency. The CPAS program shifts commuters from personal vehicles to public transportation, freeing up thousands of parking spaces that could encourage higher commercial office occupancy rates, provide cost-effective transportation to employees, improve air quality, and reduce roadway congestion. The program is the largest of its kind in the nation and could, and could become a model for other cities to follow to sustainably address transportation challenges by encouraging more transit use. When we think about how we uplift workers in Columbus, innovate programs like uh, this, innovative programs like this are a critical tool in our toolbox. Uh, Director, do you have any comments on the CPAS program? Thank you. Uh, again, I, I, th this is an important um, innovative project um, that we really appreciate the leadership of the CID for taking on. I look forward to working with uh, Councilmember Favors, Chair Favors of Public Service and Transportation on uh, other innovative programs like this to uh, reduce congestion in our urban core. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor. Remy, President Hardin. Passed. The last ordinance that we have in council this evening is 0571 to amend the 2018 capital improvement budget to authorize the city auditor to transfer cash and appropriation between projects within the development taxable bond fund and to authorize the director of department of development to continue to provide financial assistance to small businesses through the NCR interior and exterior improvement grants program and to authorize the expenditure of 550,000 uh, within the streets and highways bond fund and to declare an emergency. Director, would you be able to uh, provide background on the NCR program? Absolutely. We're currently, or uh, President uh, Hardin, members of council, we're currently undergoing a comprehensive assessment of our local small business and entrepreneurial ecosystem with a specific focus on small business development to drive neighborhood revitalization. In this regard, we are specifically looking for gaps and opportunities within the ecosystem where the city can play a more meaningful role through city-sponsored services, products, and collaborations. While the assessment is being carried out, we want to continue to provide interior and exterior grants and design services through the Neighborhood Commercial Revitalization Program. The funds requested tonight will be used to recapitalize our funding and award funding to property owners and businesses operating or looking forward or looking to operate in designated NCR districts. Upon completion of the small business assessment, the NCR program will continue as a key program component of a new small business agenda by helping increase the quantity and quality of neighborhood-based office and retail space within the corridors, providing access to business assistance and services, and facilitating the delivery of other economic development services. Thank you, Director. Uh, we are really appreciative and, and looking forward to um, the good work that's coming out of uh, the committee as we reassess our uh, small business uh, services. And look forward to actually uh, chairing a, a hearing on this uh, in the coming weeks. 
Uh, we have one speaker uh, on Ordinance 0571. That's Mr. Bob uh, Lichty. Welcome to Council. Bob is the president of the Parsons Avenue. Yeah. What's your title? Sorry. Executive director. Executive director. I apologize. You, you just call me Bob, but I. I caught. <laughs> you asked it. <laughs> Welcome to Council. Thank you. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, it's been at this a while, but um, uh, Council of President Harden, uh, President Pro Tem Brown, and uh, all distinguished people, um, members of Council. Um, th this is a long time program the city has had, the NCR program. And uh, I'm one of the NCR team leaders with the, the part in the Parsons Avenue area. It's a really important program uh, for us. Uh, this is helping um, the little guy, the Main Street kind of uh, businesses, small businesses, small developers. Uh, this isn't uh, like what Joe was talking about with uh, the tax incentives for the, the big developers. This is a different kind of beast. And uh, it's, it's a great program. I just wanted to Thank you for your previous support. I'm hopeful tonight there'll be continued support. Um, I just wanted to give you a sense of why this is important. February 20th this year, uh, dispatch, region lags in s small firms. These little mom and pop places, okay? Mm -hmm. Columbus is, has a great economy and overall is doing quite well. But one area that we've been consistently not doing that great in by comparing to our other cities uh, is in the very small businesses, the ones with just a couple employees. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am about uh, this, what, what the city is doing, the development department is doing with this reassessment. I have 63 pages, which I won't go through tonight, but this is homework for me for this next meeting on Wednesday <laughs> related to this stuff. So th it's all good stuff. But I, I see an opportunity here with, in, 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 in sort of re rethinking about this uh, you know, right now, mostly this is funded by CDBG, you know, uh, funds. And I think we have an opportunity to, talking about, you know, the, the Columbus Way and all of that, we have an opportunity to do sort of like what we did with the Reeb Center with a public-private partnership where we went after additional dollars so we weren't dependent on just city dollars to try to get things done. And I think here's an opportunity where we, we really can do this, and I, and I hope that we will do it because Especially in some of our long entrenched neighborhoods of poverty and, and that which is uh, heavily impacts especially people of color. Some, we've just had so many challenges here and some of the places these NCR strips have been NCR strips for quite a while and we're making headway but we need more resources. Now it doesn't mean that the solution is automatically more taxpayer dollars but I think there are ways we can be creative here to have more bang for the buck for these smaller businesses. And these mom and, pop business, mom and pop businesses are great entry level small businesses. And to me, let's take that, the fact that Columbus is 77th out of 100. <laughs> and uh, I like, I'm, I'm putting a challenge out there for other folks. Let's, let's do better. We can do a lot better than 77th. Uh, so anyway, I think voting for this tonight is a big step forward. I think the city's revitalizing and you know analysis and this is the most thorough thing I've seen in my 27 years of community work mm. in terms of analyzing how we really support you know small businesses so so I'm encouraged you know we'll see but I just wanted to make sure that folks uh, understood this so thank you Bob and thank you for your engagement with the committee as well uh, I, I share your uh, optimism about uh, the outcomes of the economic development committee's uh, work with small business and uh, applaud the work of uh, Henry Glott and his team uh, as they do this deep dive and council will be right there side by side uh, and making sure that we're able to um, lift up but also provide the information to those small business owners. So thank you for the work you're doing. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, President Hardin. Passed. I think that is all that we have uh, coming for council this evening. If there is no further business, may I get a motion to adjourn? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, President Hardin. Meeting is adjourned.